Unbound, Chapter Thirty Two. I want my babies together, Mama finally says. She smiles a sad smile. Well, must be happy to keep her family together. But sad to know I'll never wear pretty dresses, or learn myself letters, and live the way the good Lord tended folks to live. It don't matter. I get up and hug Mama hard as I can. The flutter and breath what's stuck in my chest finally breaks free. Old George Cooper spends the rest of the afternoon preparing us for travel. We'll stay close and move only at night when the moon is dim. He says, when daylight comes, we'll rest in caves. Old George Cooper's voice is low and rough and puts me in mind of the tree bark what's scratchy on the outside, but what keeps the inside sapwood soft and safe. We'll cross secret trails and hidden waterways, follow the footpaths of brave folks what's trudged before us. But where are we going? I ask, still not understanding. Thomas crawls into my lap, and Willie stands behind me, playing with my hair. Uncle Jim explains, Beyond the cane break is a large lake that's going to take hours to cross, he says. On the other side of the lake is the woods. A big swampy woods. Well, it'll take days to go deep. We'll be setting on there. We's gonna live in the swamp? I ask. The big swamp? Long before Thomas and Willie was even born, I heard grown ups spilling grave warnings about the big swamp beyond the lake. People, what goes there don't come out. There's snakes and rats and big biting bugs what carry diseases what make you die. There's evil spirits what suck the life from every, from weary travelers and swallow the souls of wandering runaways. The big swamp is the devil's playground. If he don't find you, the paddy rovers will. Living in the big swamp don't seem much like freedom. But there's gators living in the swamp, I say, covering Thomas's ears. I's not gonna lie, old George Cooper says, his voice low and serious. There's dangers, bears, gators, and wildcats. Living in the swamp takes courage and skill. But if anyone's got skill, he looks at Uncle Jim, he do. Deep's the safest place till white folks come to their senses, Uncle Jim says. Lots of folks is already living there, already living in peace, where no planter or paddy roller can find them. Old George Cooper nods. Things go right, you'll be deep before autumn's moon. I pull Willie round and squeeze him and Thomas close. By then, Master Allen's tobacco should be dry and ready for bundling. Seems strange how little that matters now. It's barely been a day, but feels like forever since I sneaked away from the big house. I wonder if the missus took to her bed when she found out I was gone. I wonder if Anna had to bring her supper upstairs. Remembering Anna gives me a grieving feeling, and I ask the good Lord to send his angels to keep her safe. When night falls, Uncle Jim and old George Cooper leave the cave to hunt squirrels and forage for berries. Thomas and Willie is asleep on the beds, but Mama, Aunt Sarah, and me sit at the table. Okay, that is the end of chapter 32. So go ahead and share your titles. <clears throat> chapter 33. A pine knot torch stick, sticks in a slit what's carved into the table. It casts ghosty shadows on the cave wall. We don't talk but listen for the howl of the dogs or the hoot of an owl. Waiting and listening makes my heart thump, louder and heavier than Master Allen's footfalls when he's storming. Flickering shadows is making me sleepy when my eye catches something moving in the darkness. Mama! Aunt Sarah! <clears throat> I whisper. Something long and black slithering under the beds. Mama takes the torch, and we both tiptoe close enough to hear Willie's breathing and see the dribble of sleep what runs down his chin. 
close enough to see two cloudy blue cat-shaped eyes staring out of a dull, dark coil. A snake. The blackest, fattest, meanest looking snake I ever seen. He raises his head and opens his mouth. Two long fangs hang in a cave of white cotton. A low crinkling sound, like footsteps on dry leaves, scratches in the dark, and a musty scent like spoiled fruit chokes me. Willie sits up and rubs his eyes. What's that smell? Go back to sleep, Willie, I whisper. You was just dreaming. I feel Aunt Sarah's hand on my shoulder. Step back, Grace, slow as you can, step back. My legs is weaker in a swamp grass, but I step back. So does Mama. The snake closes his mouth and lowers his head. My whole self's trembling inside and out. That snake's holding poison what could kill us, Aunt Sarah says but he'll stay put if we leave him be. Willie's already back to sleep, but Mama's eyes as wide as hickory nuts. What about my boys? Every creator's creature's got a voice, Aunt Sarah says, and this snake's already told us he's ready to fight. The boys will be fine long as they stay sleeping. Did you see his blue eyes? Mama says, did you ever see a snake with blue eyes? Aunt Sarah guides Mama to her chair and puts the pine knot torch back in the slit. Must be getting ready to shed his skin, she says. We'll keep watch. Sometimes being brave is just knowing when to step back and wait. Willie wakes up again. Mama? He calls, Mama, I smell something. He sits up and scrunches his nose. It's nothing, baby. Go back to sleep. Mama tries to keep her voice happy, but I can hear the shake in it. Willie dangles his foot over the side of the bed. Stay on the bed, Mama screams, and Willie starts to cry. Mama takes the torch and walks toward him real slow. Shh. Don't cry. Stay in bed. Mama's coming. In the dim light of the pine torch, we see the snake uncoil. He points his arrow-shaped head toward Mama. He opens his cotton mouth. He slithers toward her. Mama! Mama! Willie calls, waking up Thomas. Mama! Mama! They both call. Mama walks toward the bed. The snake slithers toward Mama. Hi's here, Mama tells the boys, fear swallowing her words. The snake holds his angry head high, and I see the missus standing over me. I feel her cold hands and smell her snarling oyster breath. In the hollow, white hollow of the snake's stretched mouth, his sharp fangs flash. Aunt Sarah pops up and taps her cane. The snake turns, and before my thoughts shape sense, I grab a rock, move past Mama, and drop it onto the snake's gaping head. Keep your mouth closed, I scream, much louder than I should. Keep your mouth closed! Blood squirts from the snake's crushed skull, but he still squirms. Mama rushes to the bed and takes Willie into her arms. Thomas wriggles beside her, and her arms open to hold him, too. Hush, little babies, Mama sings, but her voice withers into rasps. At my feet, the snake twitches and turns. Leave it be, Aunt Sarah says. Those white things still got poison in them. Even dead, a snake what's got venom can kill. The coiled snake puts me in mind of the patty roller we left laying in the woods. Even knocked out, them what's got venom can kill. Okay, that's the end of that chapter. What would you call it? <clears throat> Chapter 2.
Chapter 34 Finally, Uncle Jim comes in carrying a bundle of berries and a basket what smells like heaven. What have we here? he asks. Aunt Sarah tells him how I dropped the rock and killed the snake, how I saved Mama and maybe Willie. Old George Cooper takes another rock and severs the snake's head completely. Using the tip of Aunt Sarah's walking stick, he pushes the snake head into a wooden bucket and brings it outside to bury. The rest of the snake still wriggles and squirms. Uncle Jim lifts the snake by its tail and drapes it across the hearth. Aunt Sarah shakes her head. No brains, but still striking out. Master Allen thinks Aunt Sarah's useless, but she's not. Aunt Sarah's too weak to walk far and too tired to give the boys a breeze when it's hot, but she's not useless. Aunt Sarah knows stuff. Sometimes knowing stuff's as important as doing stuff. Everybody's got a worth. And that's a short one, but that's the end of that chapter. <clears throat> okay, what type would you title that one? Chapter 35. Later that night, when the snake finally stops twitching, old George Cooper skins it and drops a rope of flesh into a pot of boiling water. Not as good as pork biscuits, but an empty belly don't care. I'm glad my belly's full of biscuits and berries instead of poison snake what puts me in mind of the missus in the patty roller. Tempy left the basket at the edge of the woods, old George Cooper says. Got good I got friends would take care of me and my travelers. Tempy? My Aunt Tempy? Aunt Tempy's been helping old George Cooper care for runaways? Aunt Tempy what works in Master Allen's big house? Old George Cooper nods. Tempy's been helping me a long time, he says. My Aunt Tempy what tells me to mind my own business and not talk back? What gets up in the dark and goes to bed when it's darker? My Aunt Tempy what makes fancy tater flowers for the missus and blackberry syrup for master's brother? My Aunt Tempy's been helping runaways? Old George Cooper nods and smiles. The very same. How could that be? I thought Aunt Tempy didn't care about nothing except making Master Allen and the Mrs. Happy. How could I be so wrong? My face burns in wonder and shame. I judged Aunt Tempy same as the Mrs. judged me. When the boys is asleep, old George Cooper tells us about the secrets tucked into Aunt Tempy's basket. I didn't know about Aunt Tempy, I say. Less the children know, the better. Uncle Jim says, but now it's time to grow up. I watch Thomas and Willie curled together on the bed like baby kittens. Sometimes they's too young to grow up. Age don't make you old, Aunt Sarah says. Worries do. I take a deep breath. I got more worries than a swamp's got flies. Nobody knows. It's my pro broken promises and sassy words what's got the missus set on sending Mama and the boys away. Nobody knows how I judged Aunt Tempy and never thanked her for all the good things she done. If worries make you old, I must be older than Aunt Sarah. Old George Cooper takes out a small flat rock what's buried in the bottom of the basket. Mean anything? He asks me. I shake my head. Look careful, he says, and tell me what you see. I hold the rock up to the torch and look close. Scratched into the smooth stone in an egg-shaped circle with another circle inside. A curved line what looks like the moon is scratched into the top corner. That looks like the moon, I say. And that looks like a fish. Old George Cooper nods. That is the moon, but that's not a fish. That's an eye. Aunt Tempy's warning us to stay put. He looks at Uncle Jim. Guess the paddy rollers is back hunting tonight. The worms what's been crawling in my belly feel like they's eating my bones. Everyone's in danger because of me. Not sure what this is, old George Cooper says, and pulls out a worn strip of cloth what I recognize right away. That's mine, I say, and a sorrow and shame sinks inside me. Mama ties the ribbon round my wrist. Seems Aunt Tempy is sending you a message, I, she says. 
I remember Aunt Tempy lifting my chin and telling me the good Lord didn't need a ribbon to hear our prayers. <clears throat> I remember her pulling the pallet from under her bed and tucking Mama's ribbon into the hem of my blanket. What we love is tied to us forever. I say and add a silent prayer to the good Lord and his angels. Please keep watch over my Aunt Tempe and forgive me for misjudging her. All right, what would you call that chapter? <clears throat> chapter 34. For the next few nights, old George Cooper's the only one what goes outside. The crickets and frogs never stop chirping, and it seems like it's always night. Seems like we'll be hiding forever. Old George Cooper knows for sure when the sun's gone and the moon's out. And when old George Cooper thinks it's safe enough, he disappears like a turtle slipping into murky water. Every time he leaves, he brings back something to eat. It's too dangerous for Aunt Tempe to leave stale muffins or scratched rocks. But even in the dark, old George Cooper knows where to find the pine nuts in the pawpaw tree. <clears throat> Hardest part of the wait is keeping Thomas and Willie from laughing too loud. There's not much room to run round, but silliness squeezes in the smallest space. Mama tries making a game of keeping quiet, but the hush don't last long. Let's draw, I say in the flickering pine light. Me and the boys make pictures on the dirt floor. Thomas is just scratching, but Willie starts making circles and squiggly lines what look like people. Uncle Jim, tallest of all, wearing something on his head must be the hat he wears in the field. And next to him, Mom and Aunt Sarah, both just skinny lines with circles on top. Except Aunt Sarah's got three legs, what must be her cane. Even old George Cooper's there, standing next to Aunt Sarah, her circle face marked with sharp lines and scratches. In a small space above Uncle Jim's hat, I add three circles and some short lines. That's us, I say. And Willie laughs. Aunt Sarah taps, rests an angry look on us. But Willie don't notice and starts crossing his eyes and twisting his tongue. So Thomas spits out all the tied up giggles he's been holding in. Be quiet, Uncle Jim hisses from the corner where he's skinning a squirrel. Little ones is supposed to laugh and have fun, Mama snaps. But she hushes us anyway. Tears well in her eyes. Not natural keeping little ones so quiet, she says to me. Worrying and waiting wraps round our bones like a swamp fog. Okay, that is the end of that chapter. What would you call chapter 34? Chapter 35. A couple of days and nights with nothing to eat but berries steals the loudness from Thomas and Willie. Better in all of Uncle Jim's sharp shushes and Aunt Sarah's squinty frowns. Last time all George Cooper were out, so were the dogs. So even he's been staying put. Our papa and berry baskets just about empty. We is starving to death, and it's my fault. If it weren't for me and my rightiness, Uncle Jim would be singing in our moonlight garden, and Mom and the boys would be eating leftover muffins and Johnny cakes instead of starving in a cave. What's got poison snakes hiding in every corner? Got to risk a run, Uncle Jim says. Boys got to eat. Grace too. Everybody's got to eat, I say. Old George Cooper shakes his head. Still too dangerous. But we've been inside for days, I say. Maybe the dogs moved on. Maybe Aunt Tempe left another basket. How will we even know? Seems guilt and hunger's lifting the fog from my brain. And thoughts what's been lying faint for so long tumble and spill. We got to do something. We can't just wait for patty rollers or dogs to find us. We can't just starve to death. We got to take a chance. Grace, Mama says, moving from the table to the bed where I'm sitting. Her eyes look like they're sinking into her skull. Grace, you got to trust the good Lord, she says. We need to be patient a while longer. Looking into those hungry eyes, what's still floating so much love makes something inside me crumble. Sorry about that. Earthquake. 
But mama, I cry. It's my fault we had to run. I didn't keep my promise. I didn't keep my eyes down. I didn't keep my mouth shut. I made the missus mad and she would have sent me to the smokehouse, but Miss Charlotte was there. So she sent me to the blackberry patch and Jordan helped me, but made me get scratches anyway, cause the missus would be looking for him. And he was right. My thoughts leaped faster and spilled cider. She wanted Master Allen to bring me to the auction block, but he said no, cause I was the vestment. That's when the missus told Master Allen to sell Thomas and Willie. Only toddlers don't fetch enough money. So the missus told him to sell you too. Said he'd get more money if you was sold with him. And selling you would learn me who I am and where I belong. Because I'm haughty, mama. And I don't know my place. If I kept my mouth shut and my eyes down, Uncle Jim would be tending our moonlight garden and we'd all be eating food what's left over from the big house. I broke my promise. The good Lord knows I can't be trusted and now he don't care. Now we is all starving and maybe going to get caught or even die. Mama draws me close. Her gown smells damp and swampy, but still she smells like Mama. And I stop talking to catch my breath and breathe in Mama's kindness. My sweet, sweet Grace, she says. Some folks don't need a reason to hate, but, shh, Mama says, hating's the choice what's got nothing to do with you. But if I kept my promises, if I didn't talk back, if I kept my eyes down, I was wrong to keep you from looking at the stars, Mama says, kissing my hair and resting her head on mine. That's where the good Lord and his angels live. That's where hope shines her beautiful face. Uncle Jim sits on the other side of me, Gracie, he says. I'd rather be eating worms I dug myself in scraps from Alan's table. He looks at old George Cooper. Maybe Grace is right. Maybe we need to take a chance. I'll go, old George Cooper says. I won't go far, but I'll go. The good Lord's love and forgiveness wrap round me, and some of my shameful feelings start melting away. But my family's still in danger because of me, and guilty, ghosty worries linger. Uncle Jim's still searching the cave for critters when old George Cooper comes back, carrying Aunt Tempe's basket. Our belly's been filling with nuts and berries so long, the smell of big house food makes my stomach jump. Still warm and no maggots, old George Cooper says. Tampy must have just left it. Before we finish devouring our ham and Johnny cakes, he pulls out a flat gray rock what's got scratches in it. Two wavy lines like the ruffle on Anna's collar. That's water, he explains. Tampy's telling us it's safe to leave. He looks at me. Good, we took the chance. Uncle Jim pushes our food away. Tonight's the night. He and Mama jump up and bundle the boys in their extra shirts. Aunt Sarah gives them the spoonful of quiet. I rewrap our dinner. Now there's no room in our bellies for food. Now we is all of us stuffed with fear. And that is the end of the chapter. And that's all we have time for.